So I would expect this doesn't take you very long. I, I'm concerned because so few of you made it this far, but not terribly concerned if you've, you know, if you're in the middle of the homework somewhere, but a little more concerned if you haven't bothered to start. Sorry, the inner radius is 10 meters, not 50. So I think this is your sum. We're not including the people in this, but that's okay. So when we just add these two together, it's just gonna be some huge number. So uh, scientific notation it for me, will you? Give me two decimal places. Are we still doing it? Uh, I'll increase level of concern. I'm going to dartboard my... Uh... Oh, I have somebody's got it? Go ahead. Hope so. It used to be kilograms, meters squared, and I'm not going to verify if that's right or wrong. So if you get a different number, you guys should fight it out amongst each other. So the first question has nothing to do with angular momentum. They want to figure out how fast does the space station need to be spun in order for the people on the space station to experience gravity. So we're assuming that they're walking on the inner edge like that. And it's going to be spun in some direction for them to experience that. This part's pretty easy. So if you're not exactly sure where to begin, they need to have a acceleration that matches G. And the acceleration we're talking about here is going to be the centripetal acceleration. So their centripetal acceleration is based on the angular speed of the station times their radius. We need that to be G. So 10 meters per second squared has to equal omega squared times 50 for the radius. This is the angular speed that the space station must be spinning at in order for the people on the outer edge to experience 1G. Now, if I was asking this on a test, I would probably have three subsequent questions which aren't in here. And you'll claim that I, you know, I'm terribly mean by asking these on a test without having you guys do them first. But there's absolutely no reason why you shouldn't be able to do them. For example, and these would be the three questions that weren't asked that I think you should be able to do with the information we've already covered this year. Question number one, the space station is to be brought from rest to this speed in 30 seconds. What angular acceleration would be required? Question number two, four rocket engines strapped to the edges of the space station are to fire in unison to spin the space station up. With what force will those engines have to fire in order to provide the necessary acceleration? And question number three, what is the angular momentum of the system when it's brought up to speed? I see three appropriate questions that weren't asked, but there's absolutely no reason why I shouldn't ask them. They bring up torque and kinematics. So does everybody understand what those three questions are? And does anybody have any follow-up questions for me about what I expect on those? Yeah. Yeah, that'd probably be one way to do it. And that would be just as fine as any other way. I'd probably just, I would probably calculate it as having four torques acting on the system and set that equal to the acceleration it found. But either one of those is mathematically <laughs> identical. So you'll have no trouble with that then. Um, interesting thing though, you can't just do that, can you? You have to be careful about how you do that. You can't put the engines anywhere and you definitely can't use just one engine. Does everyone understand why? If you don't want the space station to change its altitude, 
you want these engines only to increase or decrease the spin rate. So you want the net force on the space station to be zero, but you want the net torque to be something other than zero. So you have to put the, spa the rockets on here in such a way that they don't provide a net force, but only provide a net torque. So they have to be angled to make a net force of zero. Not a huge surprise, but we do that now. So any kind of spacecraft that's out in space usually has a set of complementary engines around the outside of it that are designed to allow for it to pitch and yaw without causing a net force on the system. All right. To keep this a, a angular momentum problem, though, we should go to the next one. So um, whatever the spin rate is, we're going to need it. So who's got it? What's that? All right, let's hold these, uh, hold these to the side for a minute. We're going to need both of those numbers. So you guys got them? So I'm going to erase it. I need room to work. <coughs> All right, so the system is spinning at 0.447, but we're going to have a whole group of people. How many people does, does it say? So 20 a kilogram people all going to go for a five meter per second sprint on the ride or on the space station. Um, the direction they decide to travel does make a difference. Changes the answer. If they all decide to go this way, then they'll have one effect on the space station's rotation. I think you can probably agree if they all go this way, the space station's going to spin faster. You can just tell just by the way they're going to have to push on the bottom of the space station. For them to go with the green arrow, the space station's going to have to go backwards. Um, of course, if they go this way, they're going to have another effect. They're probably going to slow it down. The problem is that is there five meters per second? If you don't understand why that's a problem, then what's the five meters per second being made relative to? Relative to a thing that's not moving out in space? Are they going five meters per second relative to this point in space that's not moving? Or is it five meters per second relative to the space station they're standing in? I think it's five meters per second relative to the space station they're standing in. Does everybody understand why I'm saying that? Not because I, I want, want to believe that, but I'm thinking if you're on the space station, you have two ways to tell your speed. One is, I guess, GPS watch, and one is a step counter. How do you, GPS isn't going to work in this case. So if you want to know how fast you're going, you'd probably use points of reference inside the space station. You understand why I'm saying that? So I think the five meters per second is relative to the space station. That's going to make this a little bit harder. So they're five meters per second. Is a, is a linear rate relative to the outer edge of the space station that's already moving. But we know the speed at which the outer edge, we'll just put the speed of the edge, we know its speed. The problem is that this is going to change the moment they start moving. Do we understand? Now, if you want my, um, if you want my way of doing this problem, I would do all of it in terms of the speeds in Angular, or you can do the people as point masses, and use the point mass formula for their speed. The problem is we don't know their linear speed. That's what makes this problem really tough. It's really tough. So I'm glad somebody asked about it. I was hoping that we'd get a chance to talk about it in class. I'm going to consider that we have the angular momentum of the system before. This is with all 80 people 
not moving relative to the space station. We're going to include their angular momentum as part of the angular momentum of the system. They're small, but there are 80 of them. And currently they have an angular speed of 0.447. So if I have the space station and its angular speed, I also have them as point masses. Their mass is 20 times 80 and they are distance 50 away from the center and they have the same angular velocity as the space station. This is m r squared. They are point masses. That's a times, that's not a cross product. We also have the angular momentum of the whole space station there. We good so far? All righty. So they're suddenly going to start moving now. So let's just write this off to the side. This space station plus 20 times 80 times 50 squared times omega. It's going to equal. So now we have two separate moments of inertia. I'm sorry, two separate angular momentums. There's the angular momentum of the space station and its new we'll say final angular speed plus the moment of inertia of the people and their angular speed. And I'm going to have to put this up with F for the people. This is F for the space station. Now, what we need to do is figure out how do we reconcile these two different angular speeds? I don't think it's going to be too hard, but we do need to reconcile it. The people are going five meters per second relative to the space station. If we want, we can find out what that angular speed is. That's just five divided by 50. We can use this to figure out the angular speed of the people. Correct? They're either going in the same direction as the space station or in the opposite direction of the space station. So Both problems, right? When they're going with the new speed of the space station, I use the plus. When they're used going against the new speed of the space station, I use the minus. I don't know what this is. That's the term I'd be solving for. But the people are either adding to that or going against it. This allows me to use a relative speed. We know everything over here with this being 0.447, that's you. Your job is to solve for this now. Not too terrible. I feel confident you guys can do that without my assistance. <clears throat> I can explain it different if you'd like, but I'm okay with this so far. Are you guys okay? Now you're gonna get two different final velocities of the system. So your next question is to figure out whether the energy has increased or decreased or how the energy has changed. You have to run that problem twice. Once when they run with the space station, once when they run against the space station. Not terrible. I'd say if you can do it once, you can probably do it twice. Sometimes homework is repetitive because people need extra practice. If you understand what we're doing here, you may not have to do both versions of that problem because that's just tedious button pushing. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? It's like question number three telling you to do it where both the, the bullet penetrates and goes through or bounces off. That's the difference of a single minus sign. If you know what you're doing, pick one and go. If you don't know what you're doing, do them both. You need the practice. Fair enough?
I can continue this, but I really don't want to. Is there some other part of this problem that you'd like me to explain in more depth? If they run with the direction the space station is already going, then they're adding an angular momentum in the same direction the space station didn't have before. The space station's got to slow down to compensate. So the net angular momentum stays the same. Right? If they went against it, then they're adding an angular momentum in the opposite direction of the space station's already going angular momentum. The angular momentum of the space station is going to have to... <coughs> is going to have to increase in order to make sure the net change in angular momentum is zero. Does that make sense? Sure. Of course, the problem is that they run in the same direction the space station is already going, they're going to get heavier. We're leaving that out. And if they run against the direction of the space station, they're going to get lighter. If they run fast enough, they could be weightless for a minute. Not for very long. The air will start moving them along, and they'll eventually float back down to the surface. But I kind of think that'd be fun to experiment with, to be quite honest with you. We've not built anything that can actually do this, but should we ever build one of these? It could be kind of fun. You could run until you're flying and then you'd slowly settle back down as the air speeds you back up to be in the same speed as the space station. I would hope it'd be slow, but it'd be kind of fun, I guess. Yep. No, they're still going faster. They're not going to slow the space. The space station's got a lot of inertia compared to them. So they're not going to so dramatically slow down the space station that they are suddenly going to not be changing their speed. Their speed's going to be faster relative to the speed of the space station. So they will be heavier, sure. I don't know that they can run fast enough to get to zero in the other direction, but they might be able to. You know, five meters per second is pretty fast for a sprinter or for a runner. So, you know, that's not sprinting. Try it out. Work it out. All right. The rest of it's all about energy. I don't think there's anything else that's really about this problem that's problem solving. I think the rest of it is pretty. Uh... Yeah. See, there's not much there. So I, don't, I think we're good. Any other homework question you'd like me to get you started on? Chloe? The ramp one is number eight. A solid sphere of mass 2 and radius 10 is rolled up an incline. How far up the incline does the sphere go? All right. Um, what part of it do you want me to show you how to do it? Or do you want me to talk about the last part of the question? Uh, the ring is going to go further up the ramp. And the reason is because it's going to have to have more energy to be at the same speed as the disc. It's harder to turn it. So the solid cylinder has less inertia than a ring. And if they have the same mass to get them to go the same speed, the ring is going to have to have more energy. So the simple way of saying, I mean, this, the, the mathematical way of writing that would be to have a little bit of a lead leading up to the ramp and then the ramp. So solid cylinder and ring. When this is rolling at omega and this is rolling at omega, we're told they're given the same linear speed. So the, let's consider the ring's energy and the, dis, the cylinder's energy. The cylinder is one half m v squared plus one half i omega squared which is one half m v squared plus one half times one half um, m r squared times v over r squared we're told they're rolling so i can use all those conditions there 
good so far. Um, the half times a half makes a fourth. One half plus a fourth is three fourths. So this is going to be three fourths m v squared. The ring. One half m v squared plus one half i omega squared. That's one half m v squared plus one half m r squared v over r squared. This, when I add it all up, is going to be m v squared. So when I'm comparing the amount of kinetic energy the system has, the one on the right has more kinetic energy than the one on the left. It will go to a higher place on the ramp because it, both of these can express their energy as one half m, or as mgh when they make it to their maximum height on the ramp. So it takes more energy for the ring to be traveling the same speed as the cylinder if all other things are the same. Does that make sense? So I think your ability to explain that is, is the thing I'm most interested. I want to make sure you can, you know, you can express that verbally. And it has to do with the fact that just getting it to turn at that speed is harder. And that's what it's all about. And um, two discs. So that's our hockey pucks are discs. So I've got a hockey puck there. A hockey puck here. And they are both given the same velocity. Does that make sense? All right. So it's going to be this moment in the future where they are going to come together at the same place and stick together. I lost one of them. <laughs> Don't know how. So there. Um, when they reach this point and they stick together, they're going to suddenly become a rigid body that will rotate about their mutual center of mass, which is now located right here. Now, believe it or not, their center of mass has been there the whole time, but as they are approaching each other, they will eventually stick together and spin about that point. Does that get you started enough? If not, I can say more. What's that? I'll go a little bit further. Uh, they both have both energy and angular momentum before the collision. You're going to need the energy later in the problem, but the angular momentum you need now. When I'm deciding how to deal with their linear angular momentum, I'm going to leave it out because in this problem, the net, the total momentum of the system, the total linear momentum of the system is zero because they're launched at the same velocity towards each other. And when they strike each other and stick together, the linear momentum of the system will be zero, meaning the center of mass point will stay in place after they stick together. However, they have an angular momentum relative to that point where they're going to meet. And the net angular momentum isn't zero. The net angular momentum not only isn't zero, but has direction into the board because they're both causing a rotation about point Q in the same direction. So they have a R perpendicular MV for their angular momentum. And there are two of them. The R perpendicular will be this distance, the radius of the disc. That will be the point of closest approach for each object. And more importantly, 
when the two objects stick together, they will have now a moment of inertia about this new center of mass, which is likely to be the individual moment of inertia of each disk. But you can't just use the moment of inertia of a disk about the center of mass. You are likely going to have to use the parallel axis theorem to find the moment of inertia of the disk about one edge of the disk. You get all that, they have a total angular momentum that'll be based on a angular speed the system will achieve because they both have angular momentum of point masses relative to point Q. Lots of little details in that question. Little details. So don't forget to do the parallel axis theorem. Don't forget to dare two disks, all that kind of stuff. I think that's probably good. Yeah, that's everything except plugging the numbers in, so. All right. Any, yes, sir. Um, on number nine, there's a situation where a bullet runs into a bar and the pivot point is at the end. And as far as the linear momentum of the rod, would the pivot pass on the bar? Yeah. yeah. But in 10, the pivot is gone. Yes. But there's question 10 that I wanted to talk about today. So I question uh, nine is the same as question three, arguably, except that the pivot, you know, except there's not gravity acting on the system. It's actually somewhat easier because it's, you know, you don't have to worry about the conservation of energy portion of the problem. Um, Question number 10, though, question nine is supposed to set up question 10. So it's question 10 that I really want, to, want you to consider. And it's something that I want to talk about in class. And it's the last portion of this whole discussion. So after this, uh, in my estimation, we've covered the material. That doesn't mean you're good at it, but we've covered the material. Um, I don't know what the mass of the bar is. It doesn't really matter. You can come up with that. So I've got a, this situation ahead of time, but there's no pivot point. We're looking down on a frictionless surface. And so everything on the surface is free to slide. Does everybody understand? Yes or no? Okay. Because there's no fixed pivot point, this can be treated as any kind of standard collision. If the object was launched so that it struck the middle of the bar, this wouldn't be a big deal. It would just be two objects in one dimension colliding. After the collision, The bar would go to the right, and the, uh, the puck would recoil to the left, as told about in the problem. This wouldn't be terrible. We would just do m v naught equals negative one third m v naught plus m v for the bar. We use that to find the velocity of the bar. However, if the collision is offset and we're told we have similar recoil, well, this problem presents no difference with the top. This is still true. None of this has changed. We still have a linear collision. The difference is that now, after this collision, the bar has experienced a torque. There is a force offset on the edge of the bar. And because the center of mass of the bar is in the middle, there's a natural pivot point in the middle of the bar. The puck 
presented an angular momentum to the bar's center of mass. So the bar is also going to be spinning as it leaves this point. A lot of people think the bar is going to travel off in this direction, but that's not true. There's nothing to have given the bar a vertical momentum. But there's no reason to think that the bar is going to stay not spinning. It's going to spin. So we need something to use for this distance. I'm going to use X. And note that that becomes the point of closest approach. So there's angular momentum, X, M, V naught. And if the puck recoils the same way, then I'm going to have X, M times negative one third V naught as its point mass angular momentum, but also the bar is going to spin. For an object that does not have a fixed axis of rotation, all objects will spin about their center of mass. So that makes this 1 12th ml squared. Right. You should clearly show that Omega goes to zero when X goes to zero. That should be obvious. But your result should show that. If it's not obvious, look, if X is zero, the left side of this equation is zero. And this term will also be zero. So there can't be any angular speed if it hits right at the center of mass because there's no torque. There will be an angular speed if it's offset. And I bet the angular speed increases as X increases. More torque. That's enough for me to say about that one. That's the problem I really wanted to talk about, but I know we're also at the end of class period. So uh, if you have not started your homework, you have a lot to do tonight. If you started your homework, good. You probably have less to do tonight. Hopefully I've steered you in the right direction. So um, I have worked all the way out through question number seven. Um, I've left out some pieces I just didn't feel like putting into a calculator, but I've done almost every piece. I will post my notes to what I've done so far and I'll post this video too. So both discs fired at the same speed and both disks are the same mass, and they're both heading to a collision where their edges are going to touch. Any questions about that? So they will meet at this point, and they're going to stick together. Well, the linear momentum of this system is zero, because they both have the exact same velocity, but they're in opposite directions. So when they touch in the middle, their center of mass is going to stay right there. The momentum of the center of mass of the system is zero. Not a particularly interesting problem. That doesn't seem to be anything that is related to what we're doing. But both of these disks have a angular momentum relative to point Q. And these two do not cancel out. These two momenta are in the same direction. Um, rotationally into the board. When I look at the direction of the angular momentum, <laughs> angular momentum of puck one, and I do the R cross V, I get into the board. And when I look at the direction of the angular momentum of puck two, puck two R cross V, that also is into the board. And remember, it's a line drawn from point Q, that's R, and rotate your fingers until your middle fingers in, direct, in the direction of the velocity. That's into the board. That suggests it's rotating this way, how point Q. The other one, R cross V into the board, suggests a rotational vector that is also into the board. They have 
the same direction, angular momentum. You're going to have to convince yourself of a method to figure that out. But that being said, when they come into contact in the middle, the angular momentum is not zero. It's whatever the angular momentum of the two pucks are. So angular momentum there plus angular momentum there. Now, angular momentum is a conserved quantity. And since both of these are going to be into the board, I'm going to get an angular momentum here where these objects are going to stick and spin about their center of mass. This becomes a rigid body that has a axis of rotation through a point inside this rigid body, these two disks. And point Q becomes the axis of rotation. So angular momentum. The angular momentum before has to be equal to the angular momentum after. Well, L is just going to be R perpendicular MV. And there are two of them. I'm pretty sure R perpendicular is just going to be whatever the radius of the disk is. That would be the point of closest approach from the center of mass of the disk to its edge is going to be R perpendicular. We've talked about that a lot. Do I need to draw that for you guys? All right. That's good. Um, and I think it's going to be the same for both disks as they both have the same mass, same velocity, and same R perpendicular. Now, the two disks will stick together and then rotate about its center of mass. So I'm thinking this is going to be I for each disk times omega. But the disks aren't spinning about their middle. They're spinning about their edge. So I'm going to have to use the parallel axis theorem to figure out what the moment of inertia of the disk is because I need to adjust it to be about the edge of the disk. Now, I didn't work the problem, but I told you everything you have to do in order to work the problem. So I think I'm kind of done with working the question out. You guys can do the rest. I'm happy to do more, but I want to. All right. Good luck with that one. Not terrible. You know, of just the point mass before the collision, equal to the angular momentum of the rod plus the angular momentum of the point mass after the collision. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know why I wrote moment of inertia. Yeah, there. So this is for the rod. This is for the disc. Now, the only thing I need to be careful about is that also be I omega. This is X M minus one third V. It recoils backwards. So its direction is the opposite direction that it had before. It's like any any collision question where you're going to have a change in velocity, you're going to have to make something positive and something negative. That's what we're doing here. Now, this one doesn't change much when we get rid of this pivot point. When you get rid of the pivot point, it no longer has a fixed space about which to pivot. That actually adds two different dimensions to this problem. The first thing it adds is there's no longer an external force on the system. When those fixed pivot points were there, we had an external force on the system from the pivot points. That external force prevented the bar from leaving this location and therefore linear momentum wasn't conserved because an external force acted on the system. Now, angular momentum was still conserved because that force acted at the pivot and couldn't provide a torque. 
I've said those same three sentences at least five times. Be aware when it shows up on the test and you can't say them, it's because you don't write things down. But that's going to be the question. And I hope you're aware of it. At least one or two of our cues asked about this specific thing, which is why I try to reiterate it. And I try to be clear that your justification needs to mention that the pivot, the pivot provides an external force, but not an external torque. And it does so because the force acts at the pivot and therefore the torque arm is zero. These are things that you need to know. And when at class, my experience has been is you guys who get it, you get it. I'm not worried about you writing it down again, but I know which of you guys have questions about this stuff and you're, you just need to write that down. Now, when I remove the pivot, I remove that external force. So not only is angular momentum conserved, but so is linear momentum. The momentum of the puck before the collision will have to be equal to the momentum of the bar and the momentum of the puck after the collision. The linear momentum of the system is now conserved because there's no external force. And there certainly is no external torque. So the angular momentum of the system is also conserved, which means after the system, after the collision, the center of mass of the bar is now going to have linear momentum. But the bar is also going to have angular momentum at the same time. Now, it doesn't change much about this problem. There is an issue the way this problem is set up. And somebody asked about it last class period. I'm not sure if you guys are, are imagining this the correct way or not. So I don't want to go into it too much. But this problem gives you a recoil velocity. Truthfully, if all things were the same, it wouldn't recoil the same way if there was no fixed pivot point. That fixed pivot point provides an external force, which means that the recoil when, when the bar is tacked down is probably higher than when the bar isn't. The ball probably wouldn't recoil as much if the uh, bar is allowed to move now afterwards. So I wouldn't expect this to stay the same between problems. But there's no way for us to figure that out. Now, that's question 10. And I haven't gone into it at all. But I would point out that to do question 10, you need to know where it rotates. And I did bring it up in class, but I'm not sure if it made it into your notes. An object that does not have a fixed pivot point will pivot about its center of mass. That becomes a natural pivot of the system. That's important for a couple of reasons. What you now use as X um, probably should shift to be from the center of mass of the system, because that's the new pivot point. But also, what you use for the moment of inertia should also shift. This is no longer 1 3rd ML squared. This is 1 12th ML squared. It's rotating about its center of mass. And interesting little thing here. If the puck were fired so that it hit the center of the system with no fixed pivot, there's no angular momentum if it's fired at the center because the value for X is zero. So that's something to keep in mind. It would have had a angular momentum if there was a fixed pivot here, but with no fixed pivot, this would just be a standard collision question where there'd be no rotation after the collision because there was no angular momentum before the collision. Okay, I've talked all over this question. Move on to 11 now. Repeat question 10. All right. But now the projectile sticks to the rod. This is pretty tough and it is pretty tough. And I'll explain why it's pretty tough. But having it bounce off, that's actually been a bit of a uh, simplification 
because when it sticks to the rod, it changes where the center of mass of the system is, which means that we don't know where the pivot point is before the collision. So everybody understand what I'm saying? Now, that's actually a pretty tough question and tough conceptually. Not like question number 12, which is tough because it's a lot of stuff to do. This one's tough conceptually. I can't go over it unless you guys understand 10. So are we good with 10? Enough where I can move on to one or is there any outstanding questions about 10? All righty. Because this adds a pretty heavy lift. So much so that I don't think you'd see question 11 on an AP exam quite this way. They've had a question kind of like this, but it's tough. Let's say the center of mass is here. And the bar is length L and mass M. And is the puck the same mass as the bar? It's half the mass of the bar? Okay. So um, tell you what I'm going to do, not because I want to make this harder. I'm going to make the bar 2M and the puck M then. Okay. I'm still saying the same thing, right? Okay. It's good with that. It's just easier than having a half floating around. Now, I have to imagine a future where the puck and the bar are one object. Because where the puck strikes the bar determines where it's going to stick to the bar. And where the puck sticks to the bar determines where the center of mass of the bar is. Currently, I don't know where the center of mass is. So I can't calculate the angular momentum of the system. So I have to look into the future and figure out where the center of mass of the system is first, because everything else depends on it. All of the measurements for angular momentum and moment of inertia are going to depend on where the center of mass is. So let's find the center of mass. Um, I think it's probably easiest to find it relative to the end. Actually, no, it might be easiest to find it relative to the center. Let's do it relative to the center. Because the center of mass of the, of the bar is already at the center. So I treat this like two point masses. Okay? Two point masses. There's, I'm looking for the X center of mass. It's going to be 2m times zero because we're using as our as our reference point the center of the bar plus x times m or m times x whatever that's the distance from the center of the bar to where the puck strikes the bar if you're trying to write notes that are going to be of any use to you and you're still like barely hanging on, I'd write that information down. We're using the center of mass as our point of reference. I'm using the, the center of mass formula. And that's why the first mass is zero, because that's the bar. The second mass is whatever the distance away from the center the puck strikes. And I divide the whole thing. By the total mass of the system, 3m. Um, this looks to me like the center of mass will be x over 3. So somewhere like there. That's going to be the pivot point now. Oh, so many things are going to be a problem now. So many things. But we have now found where the pivot point is. Now, 
because that's the pivot point. The angular momentum of the puck has to be made relative to that point. So that means that this distance, ooh, what am I doing? This distance right here, that's what I have to use for R perpendicular. So if this part is X over three, this part has to be two X over three. So angular momentum will be two X over three times MV. Good so far? Now it sticks to the bar. Because it sticks to the bar, the angular momentum there is gonna be I times omega. But wait, there's more. The linear momentum of the system was MV. After it sticks to the bar, the linear momentum of the system is going to be, not plus, what am I doing here? After it sticks to the bar, it's gonna be 2M plus M times V final. The center of mass of the system will have this speed. Now, that's not terrible because that just looks like V final is one third of the original velocity. So that's how fast this point will move after the collision. But we also have to figure out how fast the whole thing's gonna spin. And that's no bueno because we got, um, we've got a complicated moment of inertia, don't we? If you, if you really are paying attention, if you're really with me, you know that we've got the moment of inertia of the bar and the moment of inertia of the puck. But the bar is not being spun about its center of mass. The bar is being spun about a point not on the center of mass. So I have to use parallel axis theorem to get the moment of inertia. And I have to use the point mass formula for the puck, which would be MR squared, but R is 2 thirds X squared. <laughs> oh, he's in, he's in class. Of course he's in class. I didn't even see who it was. Anybody of consequence? Ah, good. So, man, that's a hell of a lot of stuff. I think this answer is going to be a mess. There's a lot here. And I see that there's probably going to be some significant dependence on X for that speed. Interesting enough, um, X is limited. I don't know if you guys realize this too. X can't be any greater than L over two, right? Because if X is greater than L over two, it doesn't hit the bar. So that has to be true, but X can be anywhere between zero and L over two. So, ew, that's a lot of nasty. Good luck with that. Good luck with that. There's some yucky algebra involved there. But yeah, it's not terrible. And if you guys want, we can throw all the algebra together if you're desperate for it. I mean, we have 15 minutes. Or 10 minutes. No? Yeah.
Well, I see two thirds X M V on the left equal to one twelfth M L squared plus one third M X squared plus two. I'm wrong. That's not one third. That's one ninth. And this will be four ninths m x squared omega. You guys see all that? So we would be looking for omega. So I'd want to isolate it. Is that okay? Now I can combine some like terms here, but not so much. Um, inside that parenthesis, I'm going to still have 1 12th ML squared plus 5 ninths MX squared times omega equals 2 thirds XMV. Now, all the M's cancel out because the masses were proportional to each other. Um, the X's can't be canceled out because they're not in all the terms. Um, I probably can do something mathematically with that three and multiply the whole equation by three. And that will cancel out a three and a 12 and a three and the nine. But I'm not going to get anything super convenient here. You know, so I can maybe write this as two X M V equals uh, one sixth ML squared plus five thirds mx squared times omega, but I'm still just solving this for omega. So if we cancel out all the m's, so I have one of those in every term, looks like we're getting 2xv all over 1 sixth l squared plus 5 thirds x squared. Um, which I mean, we stop here. I mean, there's nothing really else you could do. I mean, if you if you don't like having compound fractions like that, you can make it a little bit nicer by multiplying through by six. But I don't know if that really helps you with anything. Um, interestingly enough, do the units work out? I've always been trying to tell you guys to check your units. The top unit is meter squared per second, x times v. And the bottom one is meter squared. So it looks like I'm going to get radians per second. That's convenient to know. Because that means I didn't make an algebra mistake somewhere. Or a mathematical mistake somewhere. But aside from that, that's a whole bunch. Is there, there are some things here that I think make sense, but not enough. Like, if you make x bigger, does that make the velocity faster? That's hard to know. Because if I make x bigger, certainly the denominator will be bigger. But I'm, I'm, certainly the numerator will be bigger, but the denominator will be bigger by more because it's squared. But I'm adding it to this other term, which I know has to be bigger than it already. So it's hard to know. You follow what I'm saying? Um, only clearly V gets bigger. Then uh, the English B gets bigger. L gets bigger. English B gets smaller. That makes sense. The bar's wider, has more inertia, harder to turn. Uh, makes sense that it would not turn as fast with the puck hitting it. That's it, though. Now, hard question. I think that's a, that's a tough one. It has so many pieces involved in it. I do kind of like, though, how on one question you can get almost all of the angular stuff in it in, a, in one place and center of mass and moment of inertia. Man, it's got a lot in it. Of course, you know what the, the final question is right now? How much energy is lost in the collision? You know, that, that could be next, but that'd be so terribly mean because you'd have to have one half I omega squared. So, yeah, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think they would do that. But you know what they have done? Just as, as a matter of course. So I'm just waiting for it to let me add a new screen. 
we want that centripetal acceleration to be proportional to omega squared times r. I'm not going to do v squared over r because we're talking about the spin rate of the space station. So this works better. We want this to be g. We want them to experience an acceleration equal to that on Earth. So that part I'm not too worried about. You guys should be able to figure that out. They gave you the radius. And I believe if you use 10, but you should probably use 9.8, you get like 0.4. Is it 4.4 or 4.7 radians per second? I can't remember. So it's 10 divided by 50, and then take the square root. So that seems like it's about right. Okay. Now, once you get this angular speed, the next part of the question is tough. It says that these guys are all going to suddenly start going for a run. And they're either going to run with the space station or against the space station. And they're going to run at five meters per second. Now, there's a lot of trouble with this question. And just to kind of put it into perspective, there's the trouble in that if they actually do run and they try to go faster, it will take more force for them to actually travel in a curved path so they're going to appear heavier if they go in the same direction as the space station because they will now be going faster than the speed of the edge of the space station we know the edge of the space station is traveling at omega times r so if we go backwards here we can find how fast the edge of the space station is going they run with it then they are going to have a higher velocity and it's going to take more force in the travel in the circle. Of course, if they run against the direction of the space station, then their velocity gets smaller relative to the space station, and they could get lighter. They run fast enough, they could, they could just float. I want you to imagine how much fun that would actually probably be. If you could run fast enough so that you were not moving relative to space outside the station. So basically, the station would be spinning, and you would be stationary relative to, like, this guy just chilling out here. You would not be in centripetal motion, so you would float. And then the air would slowly speed you up, and you'd slowly settle back to the ground. I think you could make an entire, like, fun little game out of that. I'm imagining little toddlers running off into their, you know, weightlessness and then slamming back into the ground. Just watching little toddlers get slammed, fun times. I've got YouTube. I've seen things. So um, there's that problem. Now, they're not really interested in that problem, but it's an interesting problem. I think that, you know, you should think about it. Now, they're going to run at five meters per second. Here is the actual problem. Five meters per second relative to what? I don't mean it's mean, but it's not like there's GPS out there. How do they know how fast they're traveling? One way to do so is by looking at markers on the inside of the space station. Perhaps they put some markers there, one every meter or so, and they clock them, and it takes them one second to go five meters. But if that's true, then their speed is actually relative to the rotation of the space station. You understand that that's different than their speed relative to somebody outside the space station who's just watching events. And I think you have to do it that way. I don't think you can just say that you can add their speed as being five and, and use it that way. I think they have a combined speed. Now, the reason this is important is this is a conservation of angular momentum question. If they run with the space station, then suddenly their mass is creating more angular momentum in the direction the space station's already going. So the space station would have to slow down in order for the angular momentum to stay constant. You guys follow that argument? I hope so. If, however, they run in the opposite direction, they will have an angular momentum in the opposite direction of the space station's motion the space station will have to speed up in order to compensate so that the angular momentum of the system doesn't change. You could even just consider looking at their little feeties. 
if they run in this direction, won't their feet be pushing the space station in that direction? Thus, the space station must be speeding up for them to go in this direction. But if they run in this direction, won't their little feeties be pushing this way on the space station, thus slowing it down? It has to happen. There still has to be a force on the edge, a force of friction between the space station and the people. That's what speeds them up and either speeds up or slows down the space station. Anyways, the one thing we do know is that they are running at the edge of the space station. So their speed, omega, not V, could be 5 divided by 50. Their relative speed. This is their relative speed. Relative to the space station. I'm just converting it from the linear speed to an angular. And I'm going to do everything in terms of angular because I think that part's actually easier. So here's how I see this problem. The space station has a moment of inertia. It's a solid cylinder and a ring. You'll have to do moment of inertia of the cylinder plus moment of inertia of the ring. Add them together get moment of inertia of the space station. Plus, there's the moment of inertia of the people. So space station and people. There are 20 60 kilogram point masses. Wouldn't you agree? So here you're going to have, you know, one half mR squared plus mR squared for this. For the people, you're going to have mR squared for a point mass times 20, because there are 20 of them. Times omega, which is what we got in part A, the speed of the space station that gives them gravity. OK? All good? Now this has to be equal to the space station with its new angular velocity plus the people and their new angular velocity, which is whatever the final thing is for the space station, plus or minus the 5 over 50. They have to be running this fast relative to the space station. Now, the way I see this problem is based on what's here, everything is known except for WF. This has become an algebra problem now and is not a very interesting one. And yes, the problem is asking for you to do it twice. Once when you're running with the space station, once when you're running against the space station. I don't know that you have to do the problem twice. If you feel like you know what you got to handle on this, then just pick one of these and try it. If you don't feel like you have a handle on it, then you should do it both times. But then it goes on to ask about energy and stuff, and this just becomes a very laborious question. So pick your moments. You know, it's not going to be much different. The energy one is going to be the same calculation, just with the new numbers. So I don't think you have to do this whole problem twice. I try to make this problem something that you're thinking about. I want you to think about what it means to actually run inside the space station. That's more important to me, the actual calculation of the problem. Well, it's now become pretty much, to me, a moot point. Um, this is space station. I should probably put that there. So, wink. And then this is one that goes right there. Okay. All right. To me, that's number 12. That's about as much I want to say about it. Give it a try. See how you do. 
Any follow-up? All righty. So, number five. All right. All right. Number five. I've got um, one of these. No, not a one of those. I've got a one of these. And at the same time, let's put the ground down here. Is this the one that has just the ball at the bottom? Is that right? I don't know who asked it, but it's like a ball down here. We're given the state at the end of this where the bar has struck the ball and has come up to a point where it is, oops, there. It's like that, and the ball is taking off this way. That's kind of what I see in this problem. And we're asked to figure out how fast the ball is going if this makes a maximum angle of 30 degrees. So not a terrible question, but it's leaving out some stuff. There's some middle ground here. Like in my mind, I see that the, uh, the bar has this other point where it has rotated downwards under the action of gravity and is now like moving. It's got some angular velocity just before it hits the ball. So this is from, I'll call this A to B. Then there is this instant just after it hits the ball where it really hasn't moved very much but it's made contact with the ball, probably going a little slower now because the ball now is going this way with some velocity. We'll call this C. And then the ball keeps on going to the side, but the bar swings upwards and comes to rest. Wow, that's a lot. There's a lot of things there. Agreed? We really don't know anything about the ball, except that it has no momentum before the, the bar strikes it. But we know a lot about the bar. We know the change in height of the bar center of mass. And we know the mass of the bar and the length of the bar. All of that tells me that we've probably got between A and B, a conservation of energy problem. That's what I see. An MGH equals one half I omega squared thing going on here. Now, I think this could be used to figure out how fast the bar is going just before it strikes the ball. But what we don't know is how fast the bar is going after it strikes the bar. And we don't know how fast the ball is going after the bar strikes it. We don't know this or this. But I see a collision. I see between B and C, we're going to have conservation of momentum. I see that for sure. And the momentum is all in rotational for the bar just before the collision. But then after the collision, the bar is going to have some angular momentum still because it's moving. We know it's still moving because it swings upwards a small amount. But the ball is also going to have some angular momentum. And since it occurs right when the bar is perfectly vertical, I can just write that as R perpendicular MV. The problem is I don't know either of these. That's two unknowns in one equation. So I can't figure that out. 
But Mr. Shelton gave me more information. Yep, I just referred to myself in the third person and in the first person in one sentence. Yep, that's just bad talking. I will talk gooder for the rest of class. Between C and D, nothing changes about the ball. But between C and D, conservation of energy for the bar. The bar swings upwards and comes to rest. That's a change in height of the center of mass of the bar. I, I see a, a one-half I omega final squared equals mg, probably L over 2, 1 minus cosine theta thing. Not a space there to write that. I'll just move it a little bit. Now, I don't want to do this problem, but I've really done all the, the heavy lifting is done here. I know you, you don't see it that way, but it really is. I've got a method right here to figure out what the final velocity is of the bar. And I've got a method to figure out what the initial velocity is for the bar. I'll have to do those two parts of the problem first. Then I can figure out how fast the bar is going. And the answer is ugly. Good luck. What? Um, when you know when to move L over 2, I only ask for this because when we did question 2 in class, we didn't use L over 2 in the center of mass. So we just, from now on, we're just supposed to use L over 2. Uh, I'm not sure to which you're referring. So I will say it this way. You use L over 2 um, when the distance you need is L over 2. I'm not trying to be flippant about it. In this problem right here, the height that I'm supposed to be talking about is the change in height of the center of mass. Where's the center of mass of the bar? In the middle. All right, because be careful. Sometimes I'll just write L times one minus cosine theta to remind you that that's what we're gonna use for H, where L is the value you need for whatever it is that's being lifted. And then later when we start subbing into the actual problem, then we'll start looking for what that value is. So in this one, it's still the center of mass of the bar that's being lifted after the bar swings past um, the, the vertical and comes up 30 degrees. So I, again, think that that's still the center of mass being lifted. So I think that's going to be L over two. I would hope, you know, hopefully not trying to, I, I would never try to, to purposely confuse you. Okay. Distract you maybe, but not purposely confuse you. Now, that's about all I want to do for this problem, because the rest of it is just plugging in 5Ms and things like that. It's not actually all that interesting. Um, I, for all of this, is going to be the moment of inertia of a bar spun about its end. So that's going to be one third ML squared. All right. So whoever asked about this question, is that enough to get you kind of moving on it? It's ugly. Um, and the reason it's ugly is because you're going to have this one minus cosine 30 degrees. It'll give you a number that you can plug in and everything else is letters. But a lot of this problem depends on the length of the bar. And the length of the bar isn't actually given to you. You will find that there is a length dependence on this problem. And that doesn't surprise me very much, but you should expect that. The longer the bar is, the, the, it interacts with the ball differently. So the, the algebra soup you get is kind of a mess. But leave G in the problem. M eventually, I think, cancels out through most of it because the ball is a multiple of the mass of the bar. So I think you see that the M's kind of cancel out. But aside from that, fun times. Enjoy. What's the other one I want to talk about? What? Yes. I believe. That was several minutes ago. And as you know, I just keep talking. All right, so uh, I still have time to do look at one more. Which one is the other one? Seven. Because uh, nine, 10, 11, I did cover a lot. So seven. A rod of mass M in length L can rotate about its end. A ball M is, okay, so M isn't the same as M. 
is dropped from a height h so that it lands on the opposite end. I assume the opposite end of the pivot, okay? Rotate about one end, lands on the opposite end. Okay. If the ball sticks to the rod when it hits, what would be an expression for the maximum speed of the ball as it passes through its lowest point in terms of, all right, this is not terrible. That one's not terrible. There's one that I made that's just brutal. And I think it's number 11. 11 is just mean. Just mean. I like it, though. I like 11 for a lot of reasons. This one's not, not easy, but it's not terrible. So um, we've got kind of two parts. We've got the, this idea that the ball is being dropped from this height, whatever this is, H above the, the meter stick, right? Or above whatever it is. And it's got a pivot point over here and it sticks. So we've got, we're gonna have this thing where the ball is about to strike it, but hasn't struck it yet. And then apparently Whatever was holding it there, magic, I guess, um, yeah, I guess we have to assume that right after it hits it, whatever's holding it, let's go. So we get this conservation of momentum question that occurs because now we've got, let's see, the bar with the ball affixed to it and the whole thing is rotating. And then we're going to get this condition where it's here. The ball is stuck to it down there, and we want to find the velocity of the system here. Wow, there's a lot of pieces to this. So um, from here to here, the bar's not doing anything. This is all the ball, right? Any question about that? That we're talking about the ball? That's conservation of energy. That one's the easiest one. In fact, I don't even think that's a step. The ball's going the square root of 2gh. Right? That's a simple drop it and see how fast it's going. So I think we could effectively get rid of that first step here. And then we can focus on the fact that the ball's traveling that fast just before it hits the bar. But now we've got a problem. We've got something that we can work from. We have, I think, from here to here, this is a collision. I'm thinking conservation of angular momentum. The only thing with angular momentum before the collision is L. I'm sorry, is the ball. And there's angular momentum L. The, the rod isn't rotating yet. After the collision, though, I think we're looking at capital L because this becomes a single object that has a combined moment of inertia. And together, those two now have a new velocity, an angular velocity about the pivot point. So I would argue that this is gonna be a moment of inertia of the bar plus moment of inertia of the ball. And I would treat this as a point mass that's attached to the end times omega. Is that good? Questions about that? Because it's going to get kind of mean in a minute. The speed at the bottom is conservation of energy, no doubt. So from here to here, it's going to have some amount of kinetic energy after the collision. So we've got some rotational kinetic energy. That's whatever we get for this omega is going to give this rotational kinetic energy. But also the center of mass of the system is higher than the lowest point. So there's also gravitational potential energy. Does that make sense? So that's gonna then equal the rotational kinetic energy at the bottom. But here's the problem. The center of mass is no longer the center of the meter stick or the center of the rod. The center of mass has shifted because the ball is attached to the bottom of the rod. You will need to find 
the distance to the center of mass, x cm. Because our gravitational potential energy, this one right here, it's going to be mgxcm. And let me tell you, that ain't going to be pretty. Because we don't, the masses aren't any multiple of each other. So when we start looking at the center of mass of the system, there's, um, let's see, xcm must be measured from this end. There will be two contributions to the center of mass. There's the mass of the bar, capital M, located at the middle of the bar. Plus the mass of the ball, lowercase m, located at the end of the bar, divided by the total mass of the system. You can factor the L out. That's all you get. And it's a mess. I'll, I'll be frank with you. That, that's a mess. Because that has to be put in here. And then you have to use that to find out what the new angular speed's going to be. So this is an alphabet soup nightmare. Uh, if you want to save yourself from the nightmare, make the bar some multiple of the ball just for fun. But let's agree. Throw me an integer between zero and five. All right, so we could say that the bar is uh, three times the mass of the ball. That will cancel some stuff out and make this a little bit nicer, but it's not great. <laughs>